Enjoy listening to Letters and Politics. I'm Mitch Jezerich. It's Black History Month, and for the rest of this hour, we bring you an interview that we had previously conducted about the radical origins of Black History Month. This interview was conducted with renowned historian of African American studies at the University of Houston, Gerald Horn, author of many books, including his iconic book, The Counter Revolution of 1776. Professor Horn, always great to see you, sir. Thank you for taking time to join me today. Thank you for inviting me. Black History Month um, oftentimes seems to be credited back to the 1926, and they talk about a man by the name of Carter G. Woodson, who in 1926 initiated the first celebration of, at the time, was called Negro History Week. What's important about what happens in 1926? Well, the prelude to 1926 and Black History Month, what is now called Black History Month, um, has to be seen through the lens of the founder, Carter G. Woodson, a historian uh, with roots in what is now West Virginia, uh, a founder of probably the most substantial Black Studies organization today, now known as the Association for the Study of African-American Life and History, once known as the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History, founded in 1915. The backstory for Negro History Month is the atrocious conditions subject Black people were subjected to. I mean, if you were to flip through a library catalog, you would find such titles as the Negro as Beast. You would also, if you thumb through a history book, even history books today, uh, you could read rather devastating stories about how uh, Black people during slavery were being bred like animals because we were seen as a offshoot of cattle and mules and horses. We were subjected to lynchings, um, that is to say, executed without due process of law by enraged mobs. Movies such as Birth of a Nation, which comes out more than a century ago, which is a love letter to the Ku Klux Klan uh, featuring uh, rather uh, ill-designed Black characters, is actually exhibited in the White House, where reputedly then U.S. President Woodrow Wilson appraised it. Of course, he had roots in Virginia, although he had been governor of New Jersey, and had said it was like history written in lightning. And then, of course, uh, shortly after, perhaps a decade or more after Negro History Month commences, you have Gone with the Wind, a kind of moonlight magnolias version of slavery with rather, once again, ill-designed Black characters. So this is the context in which Carter G. Woodson, not only Carter G. Woodson, but many of his comrades decide that there needs to be this mass education project with regard to um, educating people in the United States about uh, Black history. And of course, uh, what happens subsequently is that uh, it starts out as a week, it spreads to a month, by the 1970s, it gets a kind of official or premature from the US itself. Uh, it's marked in Canada, it's marked across the Atlantic to a certain degree, at least in the Anglosphere across the Atlantic. And I think that many younger black people at, at a certain point, a la uh, a certain unease with the Martin Luther King holiday, they felt that Black History Month was being co-opted. And so then that led to Black August, uh, which stresses the Haitian Revolution, which jumps off uh, August 1791, the Watts Uprising in Los Angeles, August 1965, the Nat Turner Slave Revolt, August 1831 in Southampton, Virginia. And uh, Black August, of course, is, does not have the currency, at least thus far, of Black History Month, but uh, my opinion is let a thousand flowers bloom. Why not have multiple occasions to mark and celebrate and recognize uh, Black history? Uh, Because it's a protean field, uh, there's much that can be learned. There's much can be learned in many different branches. Uh, For example, 
Um, Black History Month implicates class struggle because we're mostly talking about an enslaved Black population that is a class of oppressed workers. And so when you talk about Nat Turner or you talk about slave revolts, you're talking about class struggle. Uh, you're Obviously, you're talking about women's rights. You're talking about BLTGQ rights vis-a-vis -vis Audre Lorde or James Baldwin. So it, it's an all-encompassing uh, kind of event uh, that deserves even more emphasis than it has received thus far. My understanding is Carter Woodson's idea of having, again, what he called the Negro History Week wasn't necessarily to spend a week to talk about black history, that instead black history should be taught all year round and that this week should be used to see what students and others had actually learned about black history over the year. And I think that's a point worth reviving. I should also say as well with regard to the origin story of Black History Month, I think it also comes from the fact, as we well know, when we Africans and our ancestors were kidnapped from Africa, uh, there was a concerted effort to detach us from our roots. And I think as a result, there is a passionate interest in Black history in the Black American community. And I think that that oftentimes uh, it benefits the larger U.S. community. I mean, for example, if you look at uh, some of the contributions that Black historians have made, I'm thinking of, for example, Black Reconstruction by W.E.B. Du Bois, a founder of the NAACP, a founder of the Pan-Africanist movement, when it's published in 1935, there is a kind of gone with the wind, birth of a nation view of not only reconstruction, but slavery itself. But with the publication of this, what, 800 page tome, you begin to see a shift in the discourse with regard to seeing slavery as the cause of the Civil War, with regard to this ongoing attempt to undermine and discredit the Confederates who sought to overthrow the United States government so that they could perpetuate enslavement of Africans forevermore, in terms of crediting the contributions of Reconstruction, uh, which were actually tentative steps towards social democracy uh, in this country, uh, which has yet to flourish, to put it mildly. Uh, that is to say that after the enslaved were free circa 1865, yet the establishment of the so-called Freedmen's Bureau which amongst other things were trying to tend to the health needs uh, of the uh, formerly enslaved. And in fact, not only the formerly enslaved, but all in the deep South, public schools to a large extent are a product of the reconstruction period. Uh, spending on roads and infrastructure in the South in particular, to a certain extent is a product of reconstruction. So. We still see this trend today because what's happening today is that once again, you have an efflorescence of uh, Black creators seeking to revision the history of this country. That's the import of the New York Times bestseller, The 1619 Project by Nicole Hannah-Jones, where rather audaciously she puts forth the idea that uh, slavery had quite a bit to do with the revolt against British rule in 1776, which established the United States of America, which is quite explanatory in terms of shedding light upon why Black people tend to be treated so atrociously even after the abolition of slavery, the erosion of Jim Crow, and perhaps why there is a backlash today, because the impulse, the impetus for the creation of the country and to a certain degree was to keep Black people down. But it's not just Nicole Hannah-Jones. I mean, if you look at the uh, rather marvelous documentary by the Haitian filmmaker Raoul Peck, Exterminate All the Brutes, a sweeping uh, analysis, castigation of settler colonialism stretching back centuries. Uh, one of the talking heads in this wonderful documentary, which played on HBO Max, by the way, was your own Roxanne dunbar Ortiz, that is to say a professor with roots in the San Francisco Bay Area. And then speaking of the San Francisco Bay Area, if you look 
at the uh, spoof of the Disney come Broadway extravaganza Hamilton pinned by Oakland's Ishmael Reed, the paramount black intellectual, you see once again an, an attempt to revisit the, the creation myth, what I call the creation myth of the United States of America. Now, these are efforts uh, that uh, have been launched, although I dare say that they will follow in the footsteps of Black Reconstruction. When it was first published in 1935, it was a phenomenon to a certain degree in the Black community. But today, it's accepted widely as the interpretation uh, of Reconstruction and to a certain degree slavery. And I, I think that these works that I've just cited uh, eventually will be treading a similar path. That's really interesting to think about because you're right. W.B. Du Bois in the 1930s changes the narrative of what happened to Reconstruction, to where now it is the story of, of Reconstruction. And you see parallels to that with such things as the 1619 Project and, and other things that you mentioned. I, I do want to give credit where credit is due. The 1619 Project makes an argument that slavery was a significant reason for uh, the American Revolutionary War in 1776. You, sir, wrote the counter-revolution of 1776, what, 10 years ago, making that very same argument. Yes, and, and since then I've written books about the origins of settler colonialism in North America, going back to the 16th century in the book, The Dawning of the Apocalypse, and the 17th century, The Apocalypse of Settler Colonialism. But I should also mention others who are walking in, in, along the same path. Uh, once again, the San Francisco Bay Area, what a coincidence, I haven't thought about why this is the case, the former UC Berkeley and UC Santa Cruz uh, professor, now deceased, Tyler Stovall, his book, White Freedom, uh, published last year, is quite a breakthrough in terms of its revisiting, not only of 1776, but the French Revolution as well. And one of the, one of the points you can take away from this, at least that I take away, from this explosion of creativity. And I would also mention uh, a documentary film by the uh, woman filmmaker, Euro-American woman filmmaker, Fran Causey, The Long Shadow, uh, which is uh, one of, I would group it with Raoul Peck's uh, film, um, Exterminate All the Brutes in terms of being explanatory. But one of the, one of the points that uh, I think some in your audience might find troubling is that We've known for a long time, historians have known for a long time, that the war and the revolt against British rule that more Black people sided with London than sided with George Washington and company, which is understandable because what's interesting is that many of our Marxist friends, uh, they have the position that class struggle is the North Star, class struggle is the Lode Star. And as Afra mentioned, Black people are not only a, quote, race, unquote, it's an oppressed, exploited working class, unpaid class. And according to a certain Marxist theory, you would think that they would have nothing in common with their oppressors and they would not engage in class collaboration and side with their oppressors <laughs> in order, as happened subsequently, for their chains to be tightened and for the United States to surge into the lead of the African slave trade, uh, which it does uh, after the United States is founded and of course becomes the uh, leading purveyor of enslaved Africans to Cuba by the 1790s to Brazil by the 1840s. But yet many of the Marxist historians have not looked at black people through the lens of class struggle. They've looked at it them through the lens, actually, although they don't say it, through class collaboration. And I guess it's because they want to keep us all on the same page, for example, because I guess they feel that that's important for struggle today, for everybody to sort of be rowing in the same direction. <laughs> the problem is right now is that you have serious discussion in this country about uh, fascism arising. You have generals writing in the Washington Post about coups. You have a leading Republican Party, the leading party, the Republican Party, 
at their last uh, leadership meeting saying that the insurrection on January 6th was legitimate. So obviously there's something awry and that you would think that it would lead to a reconsideration, a reformulation, uh, but alas, it has not taken place, at least not to this point. The origins of Black History Month, again in the 1920s, is the 1920s significant in American life and the origins of what was called Negro History Week? And I guess I'm thinking of Elaine Locke, who I think ter- uh, coined the term the New Negro. We have the mm-hmm. Harlem Renaissance occurring mm-hmm. at this time. Is, is, is this significant for the creation of Negro History Week? I think so. And I think also to turn the coin over, uh, as you can go on uh, YouTube and validate, validate this, there are marches of tens of thousands of Klan members in Washington, D.C. Uh, in the 1920s. Uh, as you know, the second iteration of the Ku Klux Klan emerges around the same time as Birth of a Nation, which is not a coincidence, that is to say circa 1915, and uh, they wield significant political influence. It's not some sort of fringe outfit. Uh, they wield influence in state houses in Oregon and Indiana, amongst other sites. And I think that with their lynching practices, not only their lynching practices of Black people, but keep in mind as well that the second iteration of the Ku Klux Klan also was heavily anti-Catholic, anti-Jewish, for example. And I think that when Carter G. Woodson takes the lead and his organization, the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History take the lead, it's able to attract a broader adherence beyond the black community because many in these other other affected communities that I've just referenced uh, could see that if you're not able to squash this uh, anti-black virus, uh, it's highly transmissible and can spread like wildfire and ultimately, We also know that it's the 1920s where you have the uh, surge and the resurgence of a fascist movement with the uh, March on Rome by Benito Mussolini, uh, kicking that off, uh, the rise of uh, Hitlerism at the same time. And so this is a very propitious moment uh, to begin this mass education campaign that is Black History Month uh, to push back Uh, against uh, this highly transmissible virus uh, through the vaccine, if you like, (laughs) of uh, Negro History Week and Negro History Month. There's a cultural war going on here. I mean, this is the same decade, I I, I believe, that W.E.B. Du Bois writes The Soul of Black Folks. Well, I think it comes out a little earlier, but certainly it's still prominent and prevalent. Uh, during that time. And keep in mind as well that this is the time, as I'm sure many of your listeners know, uh, about the uh, racist massacre in Tulsa, Oklahoma, uh, where you have uh, Black people massacred uh, in mass. Uh, This is the time following World War I's conclusion, 1918, where you have Black soldiers uh, who shed blood on the battlefields of Europe and then come back home expecting some sort of lurch towards democracy, and instead oftentimes are attacked in their uniforms, Uh, this helps to give rise to a certain kind of militancy as well. And interestingly enough, uh, circa 1918, 1919, you have one of these uh, pogroms attempted in Washington, DC. And interestingly enough, uh, Carter G. Woodson, the founder of Black History, is caught up Uh, in the fracas. Uh, He barely escapes without being massacred. And uh, what's interesting about that particular Washington episode is that one of the reasons that it did not spread further is that for various reasons, Black people had armed and they were able to fight back. And I think that that militant spirit of fight back was also embedded in the early stages of Negro History Week and Negro History Month. Carter G. Woodson also warned about Negro History Week being co-opted, War- <laughs> warned who who other educational facilities would have come 
uh, teach it. I think he said he warned them, don't have somebody come in to talk about Negro History Week who knows less than the actual audience. And it's interesting, you know, when we think about what has happened and how some people t think that Black History Month has been co-opted in more modern times. Well, as I said, I think that's what's given rise to Black August because of I think that the folks, and then particularly people in California, by the way, uh, who helped to develop Black August, I think that they were trying to establish a certain militancy with regard to marking Black history. Once again, referencing not only Nat Turner and the slave revolt, the Haitian revolution, the Watts uprising, but also the uh, prison unrest in San Quentin, for example in the San Francisco Bay Area, which uh, gives rise to George Jackson and his being slain during that same period, and his younger brother, Jonathan Jackson, who tries to have an impact on that particular case of his older brother and is accused of taking judges and others hostage, but then leads to his being killed, the judge and others of being wounded or killed. And so I think that there has been this reaction uh, to what some might call the Santa Clausification of Black history, because as we know, the corporations in this country, uh, they're quite sly and devious. And oftentimes they see Black History Month as another opportunity for marketing. And obviously this is a direct turnoff uh, to uh, many of our younger people, and actually many of our older people too, for that matter. But like anything else in this country, it, it's a struggle. It's a struggle for the soul of Black History Month. And uh, as for myself, uh, as a Black historian, uh, I salute Black History Month in February, and I salute Black August, uh, because you know I've written about the Haitian Revolution, I've written about Nat Turner, uh, I've written about the Watts Uprising of 1965, and I'm going to do a, a book that implicates uh, the Jackson brothers, not George and Jonathan, in other words. So uh, I think that we should let a thousand flowers bloom. Should, should, the, the Juneteenth has been celebrated in Texas for a long time, but in more recent That's years right. has become a national holiday. holiday. Do you see the celebration of Juneteenth in that same vein? Well, yeah, Juneteenth is just taking off. I, you know, I, I just reread... Uh, Du Bois's Black Reconstruction, because I'm doing a couple of long takes on it, reviews and essays, et cetera. And I noticed that he didn't mention Juneteenth, or if he did, uh, it's not prominent, although I read the book carefully. And I think that that's a reflection of the fact that Juneteenth is, is kind of a latecomer nationally. Uh, certainly it was marked June 19th, 1865, uh, when it is said that uh, this Union general, this Lincoln government general, or U.S. government general, I should say, uh, comes into Galveston, Texas, and tells the Negroes, the formerly ensl enslaved, that they're free. Now, actually, it's much a bit more complicated than that, because what happens is that, A, the Emancipation Proclamation of January 1st, 1863, uh, penned by Abraham Lincoln, did not necessarily apply, shall we say, in areas where he did not have jurisdiction. Texas was a Confederate state. And in any case, even after June 19th, 1865, uh, there are credible cases of unpaid labor, de facto slavery uh, taking place in the state of Texas. In fact, the plan of the Confederates post the surrender at Appomattox in Virginia by Robert E. Lee was to move in mass to Texas, which you may recall had seceded from Mexico in 1836 because Mexico had moved to abolish slavery. The French had taken over Mexico. That is the origins of what is now the Chicano holiday, Cinco de Mayo. And the idea was to align with the French in Mexico to continue to wage war in the United States and to continue slavery. And that did not end coincidentally enough, until June 19th, 1867, when the French puppet leader in Mexico, Maximilian, is executed. And so uh, I like to talk about the long Juneteenth, 
from June 19th, uh, 1865 to June 19th, 1867, with the latter actually being a more concrete step towards real emancipation. Um, and of course, my book that deals with the subject will be out by the end of the year. This is Letters in Politics, and today we are in conversation about the history of Black History Month. Our guest is Gerald Horn. He is the Morris Professor of History and African American Studies at the University of Houston. He's the author of a number of books. His latest is called The Bittersweet Science. Is February Black History Month because February is the birthdays of both Frederick Douglass and Abraham Lincoln? That's correct, and uh, other leading figures as well. As, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, I was, as I was thinking about our talk today, I was thinking, as I said a moment ago, about offshoots of uh, Black History Month, Black August, and I was thinking about a, a BLTGQ offshoot. And so I looked up the birthday of Audre Lorde, the Black lesbian warrior writer. It's February. And then I looked up the birthday of James Baldwin, the gay essayist, novelist, playwright, et cetera, it's August. So <laughs> I was thinking that maybe it would be like Lorraine Hansberry, the queer black playwright who wrote Raising the Sun, which is May. And then I was thinking, that, well, maybe we'll be able to have 12 months a year built around different aspects, around labor history, labor leaders, women's leaders, uh, artists, uh, et cetera. But yes, as you suggested, uh, the original Negro history as week, month, as devised by Carter G. Whitson has a lot to do with the birthdays of figures like Lincoln and Douglas. With the civil rights movement, is that where we get this shift from Negro history week to Black History Month? Well, as you know, um, with the erosion of Jim Crow in the 1950s and 1960s, you have a reconsideration of verbiage and nomenclature, and there's a certain discrediting of the term Negro, and it's supplanted by terms such as Black, such as Afro-American, such as African-American, and Negro History Month then traverses that same path. Uh, shedding the term Negro into Black. And now uh, some people call it African-American History Month or Africana History Month. But it is here like in the 60s where we get this shift from a week to, to, to a month. Oh, I see. Well, I think it's even before that for, from a week to a month, but I, I would have to check that. Yeah, yeah. It, it's in the, And then it's in the 1970s when President Gerald Ford recognizes Black History Month nationally. And I, I guess this, on one hand, it, it's a good thing, right? <laughs> I mean, busting mm -hmm. into the mainstream means you busted into the mainstream, but it also means the other hand, uh, you know, what we've sort of already dabbled in, uh, the co-optation of, of Black History Month. Well, sure. And Gerald Ford is under siege. You may recall that he succeeds the disgrace Richard M. Nixon as president he was in hot water politically recalled it was Gerald Ford who collaborated with apartheid South Africa uh, circa 1975 in a CIA venture to try to establish a, a neo-apartheid regime in the Southwest African nation of Angola. So he was in a kind of bad odor with the black community and uh, his moving to recognize Black History Month to a certain extent was an attempt to lift his sagging poll numbers in the black community, although I don't think it worked. Yeah. And then finally on Black History Month, um, some people will complain that, uh, of course, Black History Month comes on the shortest month <laughs> of the year, and, mm -hmm. and, and that figures. Um, and again, complaints about co-opting Black History Month, et cetera, et cetera. But as you indicated earlier, for you personally, as a historian yourself, uh, you are for, may there be something, to, uh, let, let as many flowers as possible bloom. Oh, clearly. And of course, uh, for those who are concerned about 28 days in February, the 38, they're 31, excuse me, uh, in August, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. And um, 
I, I think I think that uh, this this Black History Month, uh, as suggested, uh, as suggested by these works that I've mentioned, and they're worth repeating: the works of Tyler Stovall, Ishmael Reed, Nicole Hannah Jones, Fran Causey, uh, Raoul Peck. Uh, it's difficult to imagine these substantial works of history and film and art taking place absent this mass movement around Black History Month. And as suggested, I think that ultimately these works will become the new consensus, just like W.E.B. Du Bois's Black Reconstruction in 1935. At first, it was just recognized in the Black community. Now it's the new consensus. And I dare say that this will happen to these uh, latter works I just referenced. Yeah, that's fascinating to think about. Gerald Horn has been our guest. Again, Gerald Horn is the Morris Professor of History and African American Studies at the University of Houston. He is the author of a number of books. His latest is called The Bittersweet Science. Professor Horn, thank you. Thank you for inviting me.